Hello, everybody, and welcome to my talk about our project ChainifyDB and about the question how you can finally get rid of your blockchain system and use your classical data management system instead. Now, let's start with a simple observation. Nowadays, there's a strong need for trusted transactions because untrusted environments are essentially everywhere. For example, think of all kinds of data sharing situations, for instance, between hospitals and doctors. Think of managing complex supply chains where individual companies manufacture individual products that are then put together to a much more complex product. Or think of digital twins, for instance, like tracking the lifetime of a car when it goes from owner to owner. So there is the problem of handling trusted transactions, and fortunately, there is a solution for that already, namely standalone private blockchain systems. They make that possible. So if you have the problem and the solution on the other side, the question arises, why are these private blockchain systems not already in use everywhere? What is stopping the adoption of these kind of systems? We can understand that when we look at the integration process of such a private blockchain system. Typically, we have a situation like this. Let's say we have two organizations, A and B here, and they have some kind of IT infrastructure established. And now they want to add this standalone private blockchain system. So how hard can it be? Well, unfortunately, quite hard if we look at how a typical IT infrastructure looks like. It's a spider web of various different top level applications, various different data management backends, and they are all interconnected. They exchange data in different ways. And of course, adding now a private blockchain system makes it even more complex because you need new connections. You have to migrate data back and forth. You typically have to handle different data models in this regard. And with respect to top level applications, you typically have some kind of custom query language that you have to get used to and adopt your applications to. So that all makes this spider web even more complex. And now the question arises, of course, can this be somehow simpler? And this is exactly the approach that we take in Cheney by FIDB. We say this IT infrastructure is already there. So can't we simply extend the established database management systems with the blockchain functionality that we desire? So we simply add a layer on top, connect different systems with each other. And of course, by this, we can avoid data migration. We can use the relational model that we are familiar with. And of course, also use SQL as a query language that everyone knows. And also, of course, leverage the nice performance that these um, older systems provide. Unfortunately, it is much harder than it looks on this figure. There are a couple of challenges to overcome. So first of all, we want to connect different database management systems, which have potentially a different behavior. We want to treat them as black boxes. So we don't want to change the source code or even access the source code in any way. And if we want to have a parallel execution for high performance, then we also have to handle that because they might execute the stuff differently. Unfortunately, as we figured out, current execution models cannot handle the setup we desire. So we have to introduce a new execution model to achieve that. And this we actually do by our model that we call whatever voting or weave for short. It has two simple phases essentially. First, we start with the whatever phase where essentially each and every organization executes the block of transaction in whatever way it wants. So for instance, in Postgres, MySQL or DB2. The only requirement that we have is that as a side product of this execution, some kind of digest is produced. So let's look at, for instance, how um, organization one could produce such a digest as a side product of execution. If this is our table foo here that we want to monitor, then we have an additional digest table for that. And every transaction that performs an update, a delete, or an insert is essentially captured um, in this digest table through a triggering me mechanism such that afterwards um, the digest table essentially captures the effects of all transactions within that block. And as mentioned, each organization produces now such a digest, which then goes into the voting phase. And in this voting phase, we have a policy defined. For instance, it could be that all digests must be the same. And according to that, they are inspected. And in this case, we, they are actually the same. So we reach agreement on a particular digest and commit it to the ledger and all organizations can continue to the next round. So as you can see, we essentially let them execute in the first round, whatever they want. And then in the second round, we look back 
did this actually make sense? Are they allowed to commit and to proceed to the next round? Of course, the policy could be different, could be two out of three must be the same. And if one differs, then it could still reach agreement on the one that is the same. And then organization one, two can continue to the next round and organization three, and it's a special thing of our system, can then also try to recover and get back to processing. Let's see how recovery looks like. It's essentially a simple checkpoint based mechanism. Every now and then we create a snapshot of the data that we monitor, then processing continues, another checkpoint is created, and eventually we can run into the situation that our uh, digest somehow differs from the agreed digest, so we can give this organization the chance to recover by essentially restoring the table from the snapshot and replaying the blocks that they see in between. Of course, there's no guarantee that you actually um, are able to recover this organization, but at least we try, we give it a chance um, that this uh, organization can actually perform a recovery. As mentioned, we have to handle parallel execution as well. We cannot let each database system simply schedule the transactions like they want because that might differ. So we essentially turn off the concurrency control of each system by tuning down the isolation level and handling it by, it by ourselves. And the high level idea is that we essentially look at all the transactions within a block and inspect um, the conflicts between them to build such a dependency graph. And by this, we can build execution stages such that the transactions that do not conflict each other are executed in parallel without any special concurrency control by the individual systems. Let's look at our experimental evaluation. We have a simple business relational setup, relationship setup of a couple of organizations. Three in this um, case, we have uh, different types of machines. And all of these instances are interconnected through our ChainifyDB instances. Additionally, we have a dedicated ordering service that does nothing but to order the transactions. And we have a client that actually fires these transactions. And we look here at the most important metric for such a system, namely the throughput, and compare ChainifyDB under two different policies, two out of three and th all of them, against the uh, yeah, most popular baseline in this field, namely Fabric and an optimized version Fabric++ that was also developed by us. And we see that the throughput is indeed significantly higher for ChainifyDB. And what were we particularly interested in is how this relates to the underlying systems. So this shows additionally the throughput of the standalone systems, Postgres and MySQL under the OLTP bench. And we can essentially see that Regarding the policy, ChainifyDB is able to approach the performance of the underlying system, sometimes even surpass it because it has the advantage of using um, our own um, parallelization mechanism that can take multiple transactions into consideration and not only a single one at a time. Finally, let's conclude. Um, in ChainifyDB, we essentially combine the best of two worlds. We have the world of the database systems, which provides convenience and accessibility. It is well established in the landscape. It is quite robust with respect to recovery and of course offers a high performance. The only feature that it actually lacks is the synchronization and untrusted environments. And for private blockchain systems, it's, it's essentially the other way around. It offers this single feature but um, lacks all the other nice convenience features. And by combining these two worlds, we are essentially able to get the best out of it. So thank you for your attention and I hope you have questions now.